Safety belt on. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. This is the first episode of Fifty Shades of Greys. Um, first of all, welcome Neil Davis. Neil's going to be my special guest. Um, it's a little bit of a role reverse, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, just in terms of what we aim to do with Fifty Shades of Greys, um, with the um, hibernation, let's say, of Dog Zone, there isn't a focus on greyhound racing, and that's what we want to do. Um, what you'll find out, if you're not already aware, is that Neil and I have been working in the Greyhound area for a long, long time providing data, and we'll talk about that very shortly. Um, the other thing that we want to do with this program is provide an opportunity or forum to talk about Greyhound, what's going on, and Neil and I have a chat about the, the future of Greyhound racing and the documentary on Sunday night. So Neil, I was, I was thinking that um, seeing you've got your own vidcast, this is kind of like Happy Days spinning off um, uh, Walk and Mindy. So that makes you the Fonz and and um, me, uh, Robin Williams. Yeah, I think the Fonz had a bit more hair than me, but uh, I'll take it. Yeah. Uh, one of my favourite programs, Happy Days, so let's just have a bit of fun. So. Uh, let's get stuck into it and got some interesting um, topics to chat about so yeah the, 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 it's a it's a fascinating um, or fascinating most likely is not the right word I think racing is facing a lot of challenges perhaps before we get there um, I, I know your 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 name is known so well in in racing but I think um, what a lot of people won't realize is that back in the day back in the Fonzie's days um, you actually had active involvement with the greyhounds yeah i did back in when they, they were racing at mount smart um i used to board with a family that uh, boarded dogs and greyhounds and raced a few greyhounds and i really enjoyed that and in fact i started keeping my own form guides this is back when was this it had been um back in the late 70s early 80s i was keeping my own form guides of dogs that um would jump well jump left and right and all sorts of stuff and having quite a bit of luck on the punt. That's what sort of got me involved. And I've always enjoyed the Greyhounds. I used to get a Kumiu racetrack when Peter Early was calling there. And it was always on a Sunday, really social day. And uh, I miss those days. And it was sad to see we all saw Peter Early winding up his, his great career on, on Sunday afternoon. It was some great reminiscing. And, um, no, I've, I've always I used to train a Greyhound with a chap called Charlie Faulkner. A lot of uh, listeners and viewers would have heard, um, would know him, and I used to walk my greyhound with his greyhound when I was um, in a partnership with a, a chap racing a greyhound. And um, Charlie and I would have a good yarn as we were walking around the streets of Mount Roscoe. He knew every blade of grass at the Avondale Racetrack by its, by its first, middle name, and last name. He was a terrific chap, real character of racing, and um, must have picked up on some time. He thought. So you have good old days. It's certainly changed since then, though. Yeah, no, it, it's been a. Um, I think this year for 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 you know well, the entire world, it's like a year we haven't seen for at least a hundred years. So, um, and it's going to leave a, a significant imprint. Um, what I was going to say, are they? You've been working in um, the racing analysis game for some time too. So, how did you get into that? Um, it was back, it was a meeting that held at Avondale and it was an owner that was quite on knowing uh, the sectional of its, of uh, her racehorse it was and she was in partnership with the horse and I thought, hey, how can I work out the sectional? So I actually videoed the race and used the video to record the race and found out there was so many frames per second and I could get down to within 0.02 of a second um, what that sectional was using the markers um, from Avondale Racecourse. And that's, I've always been interested in times and, and weights and everything, Don. And, um, and that's how it started off. And I thought, oh, I might as well do a few more. And I emailed a couple of trainers and they got keen on knowing, when you can know these sectionals. And, and I did a, a bit of more research, wrote a few books on race times and sectional analysis, a chap called Gary Robinson in Australia. Does a lot of time, time analysis, and uh, I learned a lot from him. Not so much technically, but on race times. But 
Uh, but I find the sexual analysis, analysis is really interesting. And it crosses over nicely to the greyhounds too, doesn't it? Yeah. Everything depends on speed. They're flat out. There's no... I, 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 are you trying to wind, wind me up by talking about greyhound sectionals, Neil? <laughs> um, no, well, I wouldn't do that to you. Yeah. So one of the things... So in, in terms of... Um, you know, I've worked with Neil for about... If I look at the, the form for a rating site, Neil, I think we first started working on the ratings yeah. about 10 years ago. Um, and that was initially just on the um, the racing. Uh, and yeah. then for me, the, the interest came with having the, <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing, but having the code and then using the code to generate some numbers of the greyhounds. But because as you say, the, the greyhounds are very much based around speed and they race so frequently and there's so few variables. Um, we found that the, 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 greyhound, the greyhound ratings became um, a real feature of the Form Pro rating site, and that's been, I suppose, the start of, of my involvement in the, in the, the racing data. And, and for me, it's been predominantly in the greyhound side of things. Um, so Neil runs the Form Pro site. I do the back end. Neil and I work together on the Form Pro rating site, and we've got um, a new site or we're rebranding the sectional site, which we'll, um, I'll talk about a little bit more in the next couple of um, couple of weeks. Um, so I suppose that's most likely a pretty good um, segue into, I suppose, the, the, the things that are happening at present, that there's been a lot of changes in racing. There'll be a lot more changes in racing. On top of that, we had a documentary on the Greyhounds on Sunday night. So I, I think there'll be a lot of people thinking about where racing is heading, what we need to be doing. Um, so let, let's start with, the, I suppose, the, um, the positives. Where, where, where do you think racing is heading in a positive way and what, what do we need to do to, to keep that, um, to keep heading in that direction? And then we'll start talking about the, um, the other things. There been uh, more specifically greyhound racing, or oh, I think if, if if we start with racing, because I think that's one of the things that I think mm. greyhound racing is part of the. Um, if you took greyhound racing out of the picture of racing, the whole fabric, the whole rationale, yeah. for example, of trackside on a daily basis would struggle. Yeah, no, I think well, the racing is driven by punters, isn't it? Mm. Every dollar we put through the TAB. Um, they take their cut, and that's how they increase the stake money. So the future lies in what Winston Peters has funded the Department of Internal Affairs with, in, in my view. He's funded them with $2.9 million to investigate overseas gambling sites. And I'm, I'm convinced, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure they will come back and say that New Zealand punters will be blocked from using those overseas sites. And um, once that is done, we will only be able to use the TAB site, which in, in, the, in looking at the big picture is going to be good for the industry, but that means every punter will be forced to, to use the TAB site, thus giving more money towards each code. But the big problem is a lot of, there's a lot of frustration with the TAB site. It has got a lot better. I do give them that. Still a long way to go, but they, I think they are hand tied in some respects with um, the contract and mm. how it's done. But um, so that's, that's where the future lies if we can get that TOB site really up and scratch off at competitive odds and funders are happy to bet with the TOB site. I'm 100% sure New Zealand Racing will thrive if that TOB site continues to frustrate punters. Um, it's just not going to thrive. It's as simple as that. It's, it's my view. Yeah. Look, what, one of the things that um, I've commented on, um, let's not talk about um, dogs with short noses yesterday, but um, I've been doing some regular form analysis with the Palmer's North Greyhounds. And one of the things that um, I would love to have, um, there have been times when I've been able to identify a dog that I'm a favourite and pretty certain is going to lose. But the TAB just hasn't shown any interest in providing an option to bet against the favourite. Um, yeah, it's favourite against the field. That's all, the, all they have to correct. do, aren't they? They've done correct. it before. Even if they do it on higher stakes races for them from the perception of integrity, they might think a, a 
a rider or a, a trainer might try and force, force the animal to lose somehow. But um, but it, high it, race races where they're all trying, it takes that factor away. Uh, well, it, it's a good point because nothing is literally stopping you from backing every other individual runner. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's, so technically or logically, there is not nothing to stop you from having that uh, from betting that way. But yeah. it's just a more convenient way, and it's a way. And again, I suppose one of the things that I've learned over the last couple of years, in particular, is that that's when the value comes in from the in terms of the price that the TAB yeah. offer, and that's where the value of the ratings or something else comes in that you can assess whether you exactly. think that's likely to happen. So, I suppose from from my point of view, I, I think, um, and, and again. Uh, I haven't set this up to have a forum to talk about the sectionals, <laughs> but it is frustrating for me, um, I suppose, in terms that I should put my cards on the table. I've put a lot of work into the, the Greyhound sectionals because from a, um, everyone I've talked to from a, a punting point of view, from a training point of view, everyone who's involved with the industry and the game wants the data, but nobody wants to pay for it. Um, and that, to me, is, I suppose, another part of the um, the puzzle. And that's one of the concerns that perhaps I see at the, at the bigger level is that there's a lot of focus on simply cutting services and cutting costs and hoping people will bet blindly. And I'm, I'm not convinced that they will. I'm thinking long term, if we do get the, the TAB website up to scratch and everyone's happy punting with them, They'll be able to bring in more options like that and also pay to have that information available to punters because that's the growth is not in New Zealand, it's overseas. If we get Australian punters getting on New Zealand greyhounds and harness yeah. and gallops because they have the information, that's where the growth is. But it's Aussies won't bother betting if they haven't got the sectional, simple as that. I, I wouldn't bother. No. Um, and you wouldn't bother either if you haven't got the ratings or the, the sectionals. I'm not no, I, 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 I won't bet. Yeah, it's as yeah and as that. as well, I think. The serious punters want that information without it paying the bet. So that's where the growth is. So I think down the track, if the TRB site comes right, it will happen. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that, um, as I said, this is a, a pilot, and as much as anything else, uh, I'm using this to, um, I suppose, hope, hopefully, set a little bit of a roadmap of where the um the blog or the vidcast is going to go the next few weeks so one of the things i want to do is talk to each of the clubs over the next few weeks but i'd also like to talk to someone from um the tab and see if we can get someone to sort of have this type of chat as well uh yeah. which is why it was, it was useful to have this chat the other thing that i think um we need to talk about because it's again if we don't i don't think we can have any credibility um, but the documentary on um, Sunday night. Now, one, one of the things that um, I want to make clear here is that I haven't actually asked Neil <laughs> beforehand what he thought, because I think, um, again, we need to, to, to talk about these things openly and honestly, but I do think we need to talk about it. Well, so what, what, was, your, what was your thoughts when you, you watched it? Well, before I watched it, my, my argument for greyhound racing was that nearly most sports, rugby, motor car racing, there's always going to be people who get injured or even die. Um, but after watching that documentary, I find it hard to justify that. I truly do it because on average, they were saying, and it's factual, a dog a day is either euthanized through um, not being able to be rehomed or through over factor. And I think it was 20, something dogs euthanized um, because of injuries during a race. Now, from a personal point of view, I've got two dogs and no one likes to see a dog get injured, um, same as trainers. They all love their dogs, but my my daughters all, all um, used to enjoy going to the races and greyhounds and enjoy those, but through social media, uh, the younger generation is being strongly influenced by the left because and I think that's the future of racing. So, personally, I think if we don't make 100% attitude change and changing, firstly, there's been a big study in East Australia, New South Wales, Greyhounds I was reading during the week. So I thought I'd delve into this a bit more. Um, having straight tracks is a big factor in reducing injuries. 
six dog fields. Um, what else? Uh, having dogs tracked right from birth is when they're microchipped. Every dog can be tracked once they've been microchipped. What happens to those dogs at all kennels when they aren't accounted for? Um, there's so many things they can do to improve not only the attrition but the, um, the death rate. Going, you know, what is an acceptable rate? There's so many things they can do that need to be done. Otherwise, there's only one way greyhound racing can go, and that's, that's to be finished. Yeah, and I, I think the... Um the first thing for for the future of any any um, any racing code is that animal welfare has to be number one, without a yeah, doubt. Hundred percent. And so I, I I couldn't agree more on that. I suppose for me there are a number of um, because I'm a bit of a data nerd. One of the things that um, I didn't like was the way in which some of the numbers were presented. So I, I, I agree, for example, the lost dogs um, is a problem. And that's something the industry is, is and I suppose that was picked up a bit. Um, but the discussion, for example, was around almost, you know, what, what number is acceptable and that no number is acceptable. So that, let's accept that, you know, we don't want to see any fatalities and no dogs put down. Mm. And I think that's something we need to work towards as much as possible. So the greyhounds to me are being very much put in the spotlight and, and what I didn't like about that was that it seemed to be a very much a preset view of what the, who the, who the problem was, um, what was going on. Um, I, I did a little bit of research myself, for example, and I found out that um, in a five, five year period up to was it the last year or so, um, over 16,000 dogs have been put down by one um, council. And so, so, again, if that number had been the number that have been, and, and again, any number is not a good number, mm. but I think part of the problem for me is that there isn't, um, because there's no benchmark, benchmark is not the right word, because no one's, I suppose, because they're taking the dogs in isolation or greyhounds, in isolation, I think it's, it's become quite an emotive. Um, the other thing that I thought, Neil, and, and again, it's, it is difficult because no one likes seeing, you know, fatalities and racing accidents, but the way in which, as you know, the way in which you record that or you measure that is you look at the number of starts, the number of dogs, and so you get a sense of how often it happens. And the way the data was presented to me it was just the number put up there and whatever number they put up there was going to look bad. But I'll, I'll do the, I haven't actually done the sums yet, but if you think about the number of dogs, there'd be something like 50,000 runs, um, individual runs per year. And I'll do, yeah. do, do the numbers. Um, and then you put the, the injuries into the context of that. Then you're getting, you know, 99, over 99% of, of dogs go around without any injuries. So it's, it was difficult for me because I, I agree entirely with what you have, you know, you said about the terms of what racing needs to do. Um, but I do think that the, um, the problem that I had was that the, the documentary to mind, obviously I have my biases as well, but it was set up to get an emotional reaction. Um, <clears throat> it was almost like they had their view of what the answer was before they started recording. And the other example I, I gave was um, um, Mr. Cross clearly, how do you feel about being called a de degenerative gambler, Neil? It's a it's vice. So, uh, it's an entertainment business. That's what we, we, we enjoy it for. We, I love yeah. watching dogs race. And the last thing we want to see is, is a dog going tumbling over and breaking its back or breaking uh, its leg. Absolutely. The vet, the vet showed, was interesting, the vet showed um, the injuries in the hock that um, were caused by the stress of going around a bend. So, yeah, and you can see dogs going around bends, the stress on those joints, especially when they fall or get knocked. So the answer, the answer is, I think ASAP, we have to get straight tracks in. Uh, and in the interim, go back to six dog fields. I was watching a race in Wanganui last week. It was only six dogs. And there was no interference going into that first bend. The dogs with those 
two less dogs. Um, there was no knocking and shoving as you nearly always see in a 520 race. Yeah, they, they, but, they did the, they had a trial of it down at um, Christchurch, you might remember, yeah. last year. And, and I, again, once you get, get used to it, I think it, um, I suppose, um, from a punting point of view, it just changed what the perception of um, uh, value was. But having yeah. said that, one of the things that you know we've experienced ourselves is that we know that um, the way with the way that the greyhounds are bet that the favourites are generally overbet regardless. So it's a six six dog yeah. field. It's going to be um, it's going to be a um, um, yeah. it's still going to be a fa a, a favourite. Um, I think the perception is out there that greyhound racing doesn't need to happen because of the injuries and deaths to animals. And unless they get this sorted out ASAP, um, the future of greyhound racing isn't good. And then uh, galloping as well with the whip use. That's another topic we could go and do one day. But um, whip use is going to be banned one day. So why not be proactive and ban the thing right now? Just why be reactive, be proactive. So let's get these great tracks, get these lures in the middle of the track, get the grills higher, um, do all that. Be the little thing you can, track dogs properly, be, be transparent. Um, rather than to sit back and react to the media. Yeah, I think that's that's a fair, a fair call that I think there has been um, at a corporate level, as I mentioned before, that hmm. the focus does appear to have been on cutting um, where they can where they can save money as opposed to effectively yeah. re-engineering the business um, yeah. and that that does worry me a bit um, but yeah th as I said I think it's um, it's most likely not a great topic to start a, a, a pilot on Neil but I think in, in the other respects um, it's been a really good conversation because I think there's some ideas there that um, I can pick up and explore with clubs. And as I said, one of the things is I would like to get some people from the the industry code to yeah. to talk to. Um, mm. From my experience, that's that's been something that, again, has been lacking is that um, my initial involvement was um, in racing was through a racing club, as you know, and that's how we met. Um, yeah. And the weird thing about that is that you really only have any, and, and I suppose it's going back a few years, but like a lot of things, you only really tend to have involved with the industry body when things were going badly. And that um, there isn't a lot of, um, and for me, it's really around that communication is that we need to improve the communication. The other thing that I'd, I suppose I'd mention um, is the, um, the fact that a lot of what is happening in racing and, and all codes is built on what's happened in the past. And, um, you know, you go to the races um, or you go to a committee meeting um, in racing and horse racing, and you'll see that a lot of people are our age or even older. And I think one of the, the big things for me is that for racing to have a future, first and foremost, animal safety. But I think there has to be some relevance. It needs to generate some, or get relevant to the younger generation. And that's a challenge if we're going to continue to do things the way that we've um, always done them in the past. Yeah, and that's the big challenge with the way the readers go and cutting costs and everything. The last thing they're going to be doing is want to restructure uh, Greyhound tracks. So, yeah, anyway, that's true. We'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, that was, that was pretty good for something unscripted. It's given me weeks and weeks and weeks of things to follow up. Um, yeah. So um, for both the viewers out there, um, um, we'll most likely say goodbye to Neil at this stage. And coming up, I've got some sect information on the sectionals of Palmerston North. And we might have a look at um, some upcoming racing. But Neil, I just want to thank you um, for your role reversal. Um, okay. and, and as I said, um, form, um, Neil, Neil's primary site is formpro.co.nz um, and you also do um, the, the spin-off joke for those that aren't aware you do your own regular weekly vidcast on Friday with the goat um, yep. so, so that makes me 
second to the goat, I suppose, because no one's going to outgoat the goat. So anyway, now I just want to thank you for your time today. Um, and uh, I'll make a note of some of these points that I think would be worthwhile, certainly um, if this um, blog vidcast gets any, any traction, I think there's some things there. And, and again, one of the reasons why I'm in a way, I suppose, I'm keen to, to do this outside um, Rita is simply because it, it allows us to ask these questions, not in a, a negative way, but I think, you know, we need to have a discussion as an industry. Yeah, true, right, and I definitely do. Yeah, and that's been good chatting to you, and, and I certainly appreciate your hard work on the, in all the sites, Form Pro rating sites and the sectionals, and the Form Pro site as well. So I know how much work you put into them. And yeah. All we want is an industry that has run really well and, and will be thriving for a lot of people, was what? 50,000, 70,000 people rely on racing for an income. So. Yeah, and, and, and again, I think that's the um, uh, just completely bizarrely I was reading about um, well obviously we spend too much time reading Neil that's our problem we get ourselves in the trouble by reading but I, I was reading about um, the detective work has now gone open source that there are people that use the technology Google um, mapping all those type of things they can yeah. see a video and they can use the available tools to actually work down where people were so if someone says this video is a recording of you know grower activity in place x they can either prove or disprove it and so there's a lot of work that's happening and I, I suppose for me i've been working in it for 20 odd years and one of the biggest changes over there over that time is that in the past all the ideas were top down and now mm. we're technology driven we're data driven and mm. in a way i think we're, we're demonstrating that because a lot of the things that that we're doing aren't really supported yet by the um, the powers that be, um, but I think data and web-based information is the, the the only way of the future. Hundred percent, agree, hundred percent. Anyway, we should stop agreeing, Neil. And you've got um, <laughs> so you you're back into the um, obviously with the horses um, racing. There's I think there's Wanganui tomorrow, isn't there? Yeah, Wanganui tomorrow and. Um on Saturday, it's going to be a heavy track with the rain forecast. So, big fields, but looking forward to getting back into it. I enjoyed Booker Co races last week. So, no, it's good to catch up and um, happy punting, everybody. Uh, thank you, Neil. Got it.